We have with us uh, a very important policymaker, Rahul Kular, chairman of uh, the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, joins in. Good morning, Mr. Kular. Thank you very much for sparing time for us. Uh, so, first, uh, a bit of uh, uh, you know uh, expl explanation and elaboration on this uh, communications commission that uh, is being mooted uh, with the TD Sat and the Tri uh, getting rolled into it. Though there will be an appellate authority, can you just tell us what are the broad contours of this paper? Um, I don't really know the contours of the paper because the drafting of such a bill is left in the hands of the government and the authority is completely independent of the government. So uh, all I know is what I have read, read in the papers. Um, essentially it's a rehash of the version uh, called the Convergence Bill that was mooted about 10 years ago mm. and then lost uh, any impetus because of turf issues between information and broadcasting and telecom mm. and it is also not apparently clear what you will achieve by combining carriage and content regulation. Mm -hmm. Now some countries have tried that, uh, Malaysia has tried it, Korea tried it and then had to separate content from carriage. So it's not exactly clear where they are headed right now. Uh, I think you should just wait and watch it. It's premature to take uh, a call on it at this point of time. But conceptually, you don't think it's a good idea to combine the two? Uh, you would think carriage, whether it is of media or of calls or data, should be with uh, one regulator and content my, should be with yeah. another? My sense is that uh, carriage should remain with the authority, with the RAI. Mm and content should be left to INB. Mm. What I'm trying to get at is that um, the content regulation primarily pertains to the broadcast media and to the print and television, maybe the internet to some extent. Now, that content regulation does not fit into a neat model of government regulation. Mm. And the moment you try and broach matters concerning uh, broadcasting or news with government regulation, you know exactly what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very, you have to be very careful when yes. you draft these things. Uh, on the other hand, what you do not want to do is create, meaning forget the content carriage part, you don't want to create a situation where Mm -hmm. You have one omnibus regulator supervising four or five independent regulators. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't see the purpose mm -hmm. of what we will achieve by doing that. So, as I said, let me preface it by saying I don't know anything about what mm -hmm. the government is proposing. But what I've read from the media gives me this impression and I'm mm -hmm. responding to you only in terms of what I've read in the media. Sure. Uh, Mr. Kullar, good morning. And those are some very interesting points you've put forward. Also, on the communication bill, there are some reports that the communication bill is seeking to repeal old legislations like the Telegraph Act, the TRAI Act, and the Indian Wireless Telegraphy Act, and, you know, modify some other uh, uh, legislations as well. Uh, if this actually comes through, how beneficial do you think it could be for the sector? Um... I am very, very, um, I'm not at all sanguine that uh, these omnibus legislations which seek to amend six previous acts mm -hmm. legislated as far back as the 19th century will actually go anywhere. Mm -hmm. They will be tossed around uh, from one committee to the next and invariably there will be uh, people in the ministry itself who will say, look, let sleeping dogs lie. Why are you rocking a boat? We are managing the telecom sector within the framework of the Telegraph Act. Uh, why do you want to so drastically change it? Think about it, Lata. You know, the Indian Post Act is also one of those 1900 acts. Mm. We've, in the last 10 years, we've gone through two versions. Mm. The first version went to Parliament. We had to withdraw it. Mm. And then... Uh, 
the second version has still not seen the light of day. Mm. So, I think one needs to be a little more pragmatic in these matters. Mm. And while it is certainly important that one should plan for the future in terms of convergence and broadband and what have you, uh, you also have to have your feet on the ground uh, mm -hmm. in terms of how the industry will function. The industry, the telecom industry is coming out of a big mess right now. Mm. Do you really want to complicate matters for them? Mm. And similarly on the broadcasting side, uh, virtually for five years or ten years, nothing has been done and now you've started cleaning up that mess. Mm. My, my gut response as an administrator would be, look, draft the legislation, do whatever you want, mm. but first don't muck around with the cleanup that we are doing mm. in the two industries. It is far more important that those industries progress mm. success successfully mm. rather than building new legal institutional structures under which they are governed. Uh, that's a fair point, Mr. Kuller. In fact, I think other efforts at to cleaning up old acts and several acts, like what the FSLRC did or the DTC did, uh, is also coming, uh, uh, having its own set of problems and perhaps uh, will have more problems than solutions. Uh, anyway, that's a debate for another day. Uh, I, I'm reserving more of my telecom-related questions for a bit later. Uh, let me come to another reform that the Reserve Bank announced called payment banks. Uh, it was largely targeted at telecom companies and you take a lot of interest in matters finance uh, giving, given your previous policy making records in economic uh, related industries. How do you rate this payments bank concept uh, uh, and the telecom companies uh, likely response to it? Um, I think um, I think people are lining up thinking that they're all going to get banking licenses. If they're not getting banking licenses, they're going to get payment bank licenses. My own sense is not all of them are going to get it, number one. Number two, I think a lot more needs to be done towards financial inclusion mm. uh, before you start uh, talking about payment banks. Meaning, for Christ's sake, uh, if there are supposed to be 10,000 banking correspondents in the country, not even 4,000 are in place. Mm. There are no brick and mortar banks in place. The most people, very large swathes of population in the rural areas do not even have a no-frills account. Mm. So I think this is a, it's a very important development and it came out of the Najiket Moore Committee recommendations. Yes. Uh, I have had the opportunity to discuss the matter with uh, the governor mm. and as of now we are both on the same page. Uh, the authority has already issued regulations last year mm. enabling linkages between banks and a central clearinghouse, mm. telecoms to banks and a central clearinghouse so that simple transactions like checking your balance, transferring from one account to another, making a payment to your son who's sitting in, let's say, in Telangana. Uh, all these rudimentary transactions can be done on a cell phone remotely sitting in a village mm. anywhere. Mm. Now, the, that will only take off when the banks first develop the software mm. with which they deal with their clients. Secondly, they actually start opening these bank accounts. Mm. And thirdly, they have to have banking correspondence in place. Mm. If there is no B BC in place, where is the cash out? Mm. Meaning, I, it, it doesn't yeah. matter to me. If I'm sitting in a village, all this technology doesn't matter to me. There's no banking correspondent right there mm. who I can say, look, give me 500 bucks, mm. and he gives me 500 bucks. So I think, once again, you know, let's not leap too far ahead. Mm. Uh, the, the issue is this, in most world, in most jurisdictions, for reasons, reasons of financial prudence, it is the banking regulator mm. who has always insisted that it will be a bank-led model, not a telecom-led model. Mm. 
Now, this has caused enormous grief to telecom companies mm. forever and a day. Yeah. So suddenly, all these guys are again seeing gold in their gold dust in their eyes. That uh, you know, uh, if you get a payment uh, bank, mm. I laugh my way to the bank all over again. <laughs> I am somewhat circumspect about how easily they will uh, get that license, and I am also somewhat concerned about uh, uh, where the amount of effort they have to see mm. before that gold dust actually materializes. Mm. Time permitting, I'll come back to that issue again, sir, because I want to now come to the uh, main telecom issues. Uh, <coughs> the big story, of obviously, will be telecom spectrum auctions. How much do you think the government can raise? And, uh, you know, you have, uh, 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 you know, indicated, you, you've shown a lot of, uh, separately, you've shown a lot of forbearance uh, uh, with respect to the way in which uh, telecom pricing has happened, allowing the industry to find its feet after a long, lean period. Uh, will that forbearance as well continue? So, two separate questions. Okay. One, let me tackle forbearance first. Yes. Uh, I think one of the first things I did when I came here in 2012 was formally announce forbearance. Mm. Up till that point of time, forbearance was a fact of life, but not an announced public policy. Mm. It became announced public policy. So that's the one difference. Second, ever since 2012, I have always maintained that, look, if your headline tariffs are a rupee, and your actual recoveries are of the rate of 40 or 45 paisa uh, till you actually get anywhere near close to the headline tariff I don't see the need for regulatory intervention now over the last two years if you see tariffs have gone up approximately by 0.8 to 1 paisa per quarter which means over a full year about 4 paisa 4.5 paisa depending on which company did how did mm. its tariff plans how? Uh, now that is a very nominal increase, and that doesn't pinch anybody. Even mm. think about it: mm. if the price of mother dairy milk is increased every three months by two rupees or three rupees, yeah. give me one good reason why uh, uh, telecom tariffs can't be increased by one paisa and a quarter. So I think that that's the answer to that question. On Spectrum auctions. Spectrum auctions are scheduled for February. Mm. Uh, we have already got a consultation paper out, and uh, we are waiting for comments to come in. There will be an open house discussion in Delhi, I think, on the 22nd, and then within three to four weeks, we will send our recommendations. Uh, okay. If you have had occasion to read the uh, paper, you will know that the big issues here are not really about reserve prices, mm. but about the quantum of spectrum on auction yes. and the contiguity of that spectrum. So, so let uh, me stop there. I, I don't want to say anything further on it. Sure. So, uh, but how much do you think the government could actually go ahead and raise through this auction? I mean, in the February auction, uh, you've managed to raise about more than 51,000 crores. Um, given the situation currently, what could the ballpark uh, uh, amount be that the government can raise? And also on the subject of the reserve price, um, will it be similar to the Feb auction prices, you think? Uh, I can, I mean, I'm not at liberty to tell you what the reserve price will be or what the valuation will be. Uh, please remember that in the Feb auction of 14, it was 1800 that was auctioned and 900 were auctioned only in three uh, circles. Now you're going to auction 900 in 19 circles. Mm -hmm. So completely due, meaning uh, a new set of prices has to be determined, which has nothing to do with what was determined for the February 2014 auction. Mm. The problem, real problem, is on the 1800 megahertz, where very little spectrum is currently available for auction. Mm. And uh, this places telecom operators in a very um, mm. awkward position uh, because if you don't win back your 900 mm. and there's not 80, enough 1800 to buy mm. as a substitute. Basically, you're out of business. Mm. Uh, you know, so, 
that is the do or die type of situation no i take your point sir actually uh, yeah actually a lot of telecom companies uh, crib about this uh, uh, situation and you know elsewhere i've even heard you speak uh, about uh, how much behind we are in the technic uh, technolo technology revolution or the digital revolution at least a decade uh, uh, behind the rest uh, as you point out uh, do you think that government is now sufficiently convinced that uh, you can't look at spectrum and telecom as revenue generating machines but as a step to commercial development economic development uh, do you think that realization is there and are you on that uh, uh, are you agreeable first of all on that theme i my own predilection is that that is the way we have to go uh, even if we have to auction we must auction reasonably but i said as i said publicly in a forum a week or 10 days ago mm. this being our bonnet that all spectrum must be auctioned this is complete madness mm. uh meaning for instance microwave access and microwave backbone spectrum uh it is purely supporting infrastructure for the access spectrum why do you want to conduct another auction it's daft mm. uh why are we not thinking of opening up or widening the wifi band currently you have only 2.4 to 2.485 gigahertz why can't it be larger mm. third why can't you open bands up for testing technologies in the rest of the world this is common place where sharing of spectrum and uh, dynamic use of spectrum are not uh, adopted by industry instantly they are first tested by engineers and scientists on unlicensed spectrum when the technology is validated then it spreads to the industry mm. but we meaning we've got ourselves in such a problem that we don't even want to contemplate something like that so i think you are absolutely correct that at some stage this has to dawn on people that you cannot carry on like this because if you are going to carry on uh, with the model that the cag the cw the cbc and the cbi mm. Mm. are going to be the prime determinants of development in india then we may as well just pack up <laughs> but is the attitude changing i mean we have seen uh, we have a new government in place so new beginnings are possible you don't notice any such uh, uh, change in uh, uh, perceptions i have not seen any i think the prime minister has made public announcements on digital fine public announcements on getting uh, digital india and other such things i think the problem is that there is no difficulty with intentions uh you need to get this translated into action uh and uh i think that's where the change will come uh in terms of uh, spectrum and the way of approaching spectrum quite honestly i have seen nobody say anything mm. yeah and therefore i think that even now uh, banco's ghost is still around <laughs> <laughs> okay um uh, mr kulla just a couple of last questions from my end one on uh, consolidation in the sector and what your view is on that uh, while the department of telecom has actually released guidelines on mna uh, we haven't seen any real consolidation in the sector in fact i understand that india has the largest number of players if you you know if you compare it to what's happening worldwide uh, what is the trai's view on that and do you see a lot more consolidation taking place uh the authorities view and my personal view for a long time has been that we overplayed this competition business mm. in most jurisdictions there are at best 2 to 4 operators why india needs 12 13 in each circle god alone knows mm. second the merger and acquisition guidelines that have been issued have not found favor with the industry so it's like issuing a set of guidelines which are a non starter and it will not lead to any consolidation where should i go and as for spectrum trading and sharing we have done whatever we had to we have sent our guidelines back to them it is now for government to take a decision one way or the other on how to move on them mm. 
please understand the distinction between the three. Whereas mergers and acquisitions permit consolidation of the sort of wholesale takeover of individual companies, trading permits you to buy out or literally strip good assets from bad assets. Mm. So you can strip away the spectrum and leave the access network and you can still get ahead. Sharing is a completely different ballgame because sharing is essentially about enabling huge gains in spectral efficiency, which means that with the same quantum of spectrum, yeah. howsoever constrained you are, can you use it to increase coverage, outreach, reduce drop rates, improve quality of service? Mm. Now, perfectly honestly, the trading guidelines and the sharing guidelines mm. have been developed in this office. Uh, and for a very s simple reason, because if we had merely sent a recommendation to DOT, God alone knows when the guidelines would have seen the light of day. Mm. But uh, even now, I think it's uh, not too late. And since these guidelines have been formulated in consultation with industry, yep. uh, it should be possible for the department to notify them, invite any final comments, and then finalize it. Mm -hmm. M&A is a little trickier. I believe uh, that needs a little more homework uh, to be done. Okay. Well, uh, 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 Mr. Kular, I am being warned uh, the media house has also got commercial considerations and we have to get into a break. Uh, but I still have just one question on media itself for you. Uh, just a reminder to our viewers, uh, Jai Prakash Associates continues to belabor. I mean, it's 12% down now almost. Uh, so the pain is not over for the system and uh, say as, as is for United Spirits as well. But uh, um, uh, Mr. Kular, uh, on media, uh, I'm on your side of the story. Let me begin with uh, that point uh, that uh, the media ownership rules put up are certainly for the benefit of protection of uh, freedom of content. But nevertheless, there are commercial considerations. Media companies, whether television or print, have often run themselves into trouble when there are independent owners. So do you think your rules of, you know, not allowing concentration of media uh, are flying in the face of reality? If you perhaps thwarted some kinds of ownership, some media would simply go under. Uh, I cannot but completely disagree with that point of view. Okay. Um, please understand, the media ownership paper mm. refers to four or five different things. Mm. One is horizontal competition to ensure plurality mm. in the relevant market, plurality and diversity. Mm. Now, if you are willing to accept restrictions on companies acquiring market share, beyond a particular point in the shoe industry, in the biscuit industry, in the cement industry, mm. then why not in the marketplace no, for That's ideas, not the argument. Number one. Number two, the rule, the second argument is really that, look, we knew that the, this commercial problem would arise. Mm. So the way the rules have been framed, and unfortunately, they are not very well understood, uh, it is only when one person mm. is dominant in both TV and print mm. in the same market, okay. then and then alone do okay. problems uh, arise. If, for instance, you are dominant in TV but not in print, mm. you're not affected by the guidelines. Okay. If you are dominant in print but not in TV, you're not affected. Fair point. It's only when you are dominant in both, mm. then I have to say take the safeguard measure of ensuring plurality. Okay. The second set of recommendations was about vertical mm. integration. And those primarily relate to DTH, mm. cable and what have you. By and large, the DTH operators have um, responded extremely favorably. Mm. There are always one or two people who are hurt, so they will, they will make a noise. But I think regulators are not to be... Sweet. Yeah. Conditioned in their uh, responses by okay. one or two individuals in industry. Yeah. Third, uh, one of the key components has been disclosure. Mm. Uh, now, disclosure is required under various laws. The company law, this thing. Always saying is implement the mm. winning. Okay. Implement whatever you need to do and have this disclosure open and public. Mm. If you own something, why are you so scared of telling the rest of the world what you own? Yes. The 
I think the difficult parts of the media ownership paper really relate to uh, practices mm. that have emerged over the last decade, you know, paid news, yes. treaties, uh, all sorts of uh, self-censorship, uh, uh, erosion of editorial independence. And I think what we are trying to do is two things. Number one, we're saying, look, there's a problem here. We didn't dream this problem up. Mm. We told you about this five years ago, you didn't listen. Mm. Now five years down the road, the problem has become worse. And we're not the ones who are saying it, the entire media is saying yes. it. So if you read chapter five, we have extensively quoted the media, not, not our opinions Pointing. in the matter. And I think that is uh, something we need to worry about. Second, I think we need to pause and reflect, you know, if the first citizen of the country, the president of India, mm says there's a problem, if the vice president says there's a problem, yes. if a parliament standing committee says a problem, are we going to say, no, there's no problem, no, no, we just no. hide our heads in the sand? So I think, no, we are not saying that at all. We have definitely a problem with paid news, much more than the authorities, uh, journalists have a problem with it. And I was not at all hinting at that. Uh, Mr. Kular, I, commercial considerations are uh, reasserting themselves. I have to call it a day on this conversation. Thank you very much for joining us with your thoughts on all these issues.